Dorothea Lang, one of the preeminent and pioneering documentary photographers of the 20th century, Lang was born Dorothea Nutzorn on May 26, 1895, in Hoboken, New Jersey. Her father, Heinrich Nutzorn, was a lawyer, and her mother, Joanna, stayed at home to raise Dorothea and her brother Martin. When she was seven, Lang contracted polio, which left her right leg and foot noticeably weakened and deformed. Just before Lang reached her teen years, her parents divorced. Lang grew to blame the separation on her father and eventually dropped his surname and took her mother's maiden name, Lang, as her own. Lang, who had never showed much interest in academics, decided to pursue photography. She studied at Columbia University and then, over the next several years, worked as an apprentice for several different photographers. In 1917, she also studied with Clarence Hudson White at his prestigious School of Photography. By 1918, Lang was living in San Francisco and soon running a successful portrait studio. With her new husband, muralist Maynard Dixon, she had two sons and settled into the comfortable middle-class life she'd known as a child. They were part of the San Francisco bohemian art world and enjoyed notoriety among their fellow artists. Lang was making a good living by photographing wealthy patrons in her studio. But by 1929, after the stock market crashed, which caused the following 10 years of the Great Depression, she was drawn to the plight of the endless stream of unemployed and desperate people she could see from her studio window. The food lines, the hopelessness that she saw moved her to take her camera outside and to start document what she was witnessing. At the same time, the new president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, was about to enact his New Deal to help address the desperate situation that the nation found itself. The New Deal included many new programs to address the problem of unemployment and poverty. One of the programs was the WPA, or Works Progress Administration, which was responsible for some of the building projects and reforestation projects here in the local area. By 1934, while the Depression was in full swing, Willard Van Dyke exhibited Lang's street photographs in his gallery in Oakland, California. An economics professor from Berkeley, Paul Taylor, saw the exhibit and inquired if he could use one of the photographs for his magazine. He had previously worked with Ansel Adams, another prominent photographer, to document the plight of Mexican migrant workers. He believed that the photographs told a much more powerful story than the stark statistics that politicians were used to seeing. As if the stock market crash wasn't bad enough, the Dust Bowl coincided with the Great Depression, causing thousands of farmers to lose everything they had and was the beginning of the Great Migration to California. These people were referred to as Okies, even though most were from all across America. The Okies were not welcomed by the people of California and were taken advantage of with low wages for what little work was available and forced to live in migrant camps where they had to pay for water and a place to park. Today we practice the concept of planting rows of trees to act as windbreak to prevent the erosion of our topsoil. But before the 30s, this wasn't the case, and the resulting dust storms were so catastrophic in proportion that it's difficult for us to imagine. If it weren't for some of Lang's photographs, we wouldn't have much evidence of this period. All of this along with the great migration of six million African Americans from the south to the north and west, caused great upheaval in the nation. The California Emergency Relief Administration appointed Taylor to his position as field director for rural rehabilitation and tasked him with assessing the situation of the migrant farm workers. Taylor hired Dorothea Lang to accompany him and document on film what they found in the farm fields of California. What they found on their first trip shocked the people in Washington and inspired them to establish the first federally funded housing project for the homeless migrant workers. The dry statistics and essays only served to reinforce what they saw in Lang's photos of actual people suffering. The parallels to the situation we find ourselves in today can't be overstated. Today we find ourselves not only in the worst depression since the 1930s, but we're also battling a worldwide pandemic which at the time of this recording has caused over a quarter million deaths in the U.S. alone. 
the food lines today mirror what Lang recorded during the Great Depression, except now we also have the pandemic. By 1935, Lang had divorced Dixon and married Taylor, and the two of them worked together for the next 30 years as a team. They would often spend lots of time just talking to people, letting the children fumble around with the camera and touching the lens, while the parents would eventually get comfortable with the couple and open up to being photographed. Lang would always try to write down the words that the people she photographed said. She wanted to know as much about them as she could. These were real people and not just anonymous images that she was capturing. Lang's photograph, Migrant Mother, her most famous and the most reproduced photograph in history, recently sold for $141,500. The woman, Florence Owens Thompson, said her age was 32. She said they had been living on frozen vegetables from the surrounding fields and birds that the children had killed and she had just sold the tires from her car to buy food. Thompson's identity was discovered in the late 70s. In 1978, acting on a tip, reporter Emmett Corrigan located Thompson at her mobile home in Space 24 of the Modesto Mobile Village and recognized her from the 42-year-old photograph. Lang thought it was ironic that her images of poor and destitute people were becoming collector's items among the wealthy. In 1940, Lang became the first woman awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. Established in 1925 by former United States Senator and Mrs. Simon Guggenheim, the Foundation has sought from its inception to add to the educational, literary, artistic, and scientific power of this country, and also to provide for the cause of better international understanding. During World War II, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, the federal government forced 120,000 people of Japanese descent into internment camps. This regrettable chapter in our history was documented by Lang when she was asked by the Office of War Information to photograph the internment of the Japanese Americans. Because the photographs threatened to be so controversial, they were impounded for the duration of the war. Unfortunately, Lang never saw the actual images until almost 20 years later. Her photographs of the families that were forced from their homes and rounded up and sent to camps are so moving and serve as a reminder to never again allow such inhumanity. And yet we see this being played out today in the detention centers of the southern border. In latter years, Lang's health began to worsen, and while she battled increasing health problems over the last two decades of her life, Lang stayed active. She co-founded Aperture, a small publishing house that produced a periodical of high-end photography books. She took on assignments for Life magazine, traveling through Utah, Ireland, and Death Valley. She remained energetic enough to collaborate with New York's Museum of Modern Art on her first solo exhibit. Lang passed away from esophageal cancer on October of 1965, less than three months before her retrospective opened.